Well, elections, elections everywhere in the United States, what you might call the big enchilada. The question is, will the two main candidates still be the two main candidates come November? There are ongoing questions about the attempts to imprison the leader of the Republican Party. Imagine kind of thing that would once get you called a banana republic. The man who's leading in every poll for the presidency may very well be behind bars before November. That will not be a bar to him running as a candidate, but it may well be a disadvantage. Even more strikingly, the current president of the United States is in such a steep cognitive decline, it is a precipitous fall, and only a fool believes that the Democratic Party has any confidence that Joe Biden will turn up for the presidential debates this coming week, and that if he does, he'll be able to stop his trousers falling down. And knowing what we do about what he does in his trousers, that could be a messy affair. Maybe, just maybe, the reason the, the convention of the Democratic Party is in Chicago is because big Mike Obama is limbering up for her big debut. One of my good friends just texted me minutes before the show to say our poll this evening leaves out the main contender, which is indeed the aforementioned Big Michael. Well, we're asking, will Joe Biden be replaced by Kamala Harris, Hillary Clinton, or Gavin Newsom, who he, they will be saying, around the world? Well, Americans might, just might know him as the exceeding popular government of the great state of California, where we are joined with the audience of KPFK 90.7 FM right across Los Angeles and Southern California. A big hello to you and no disrespect intended to the state that you've got a stumer as a governor who might end up as the stooge presidential candidate if Joe Biden literally falls off the stage this week. Kamala Harris, Hillary Clinton, Gavin Newsom. Although if you think Big Mike's got a better shout than any of those, by all means say so in the chat and we'll try and read some of them out. My wife is looking puzzled as to who Big Mike is. Some of you might enlighten her in the chat, but keep it clean, please. Uh, our uh, telephone numbers are uh, plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. That's toll free if you're in the United States or Canada. In the UK and Ireland, also free of charge, 0808-196-5522. And in the rest of the world, 442039662625. But the elections in France are looking like a hung parliament. The right wing uh, National uh, Assembly, the former National Front, led by the Le Pen family, are ahead, but not by much of my colleague Jean-Luc Mélenchon and his new popular front. I think the Le Penists are on about 33. My colleague Mélenchon is on about, and little Macron is toiling down in the teens. So his gamble uh, on an early election following his humiliating defeat in the European Parliament elections just the other week may or may not come off. We're going to have a cohabitation, which is kind of common in France, a cohabitation between his party and whomsoever can put together a majority to be prime minister in the Assemblée Nationale. But naturally, I am most keen to focus on the British general election, which has come alive, actually, after the entry into the uh, polls as leader of Nigel Farage, who leads uh, the Reform Party, which is a kind of mirror image of Le Pen, Geert Wilders, the Alliance for Deutschland, and so on. Loosely, you can describe it as a British nationalist party. And it's beating many of the same drums. But Farage is a far more attractive character than Le Pen or Wilders or whomsoever it is that leads the AFD. I've never actually been all that clear about that. Farage, if you were asked to be stuck in a lift 
with political leaders, especially if there was alcohol involved and on board, Farage would probably be your man, although he would immediately light up a cigarette and the lift would quickly become unlivable. But he's that sort of guy. He laughs, he makes you laugh. He is the kind of populist right-wing leader that many other countries wish that they had. In fact, Donald Trump is his bosom buddy and he's done a fair bit uh, in support of Donald Trump over these last few years. And there was talk that he'd be moving to the US, but he re-entered the British election and he has set it alight. My prediction is that uh, the Reform Party will poll about 25% of the votes cast in the British general election. Could be more, but 25% is the lowest that they will poll. The problem with our electoral system and my own party, the Workers' Party of Britain, suffers the same. Uh, we're not on the same level of popularity of Farage. It's easier to sell prejudice, right-wing prejudice, than it is to sell socialism, of course. Uh, but 25% could actually gain Farage zero members of parliament. And ditto our I think roughly 5% of national support could gain us zero. But the latest polls are showing me comfortably holding my seat with a big majority over the uh, second and third places, which are about to change order. Labour is currently on 21 and reform is on 20 in my constituency of Rochdale. I'm in the low 30s. So I'm expecting reform in the next poll to move ahead of Labour. And therefore, I can say that in the Rochdale constituency, it's me or Nigel Farage. And so anyone who doesn't want Nigel Farage, and I can think of quite a few of my constituents who'd have some uh, worry, anxiety, if Farage were to take the parliamentary seat in this town, uh, should really get behind me. Don't waste your vote on any of the minor parties, Labour, Liberal, etc. Get behind me. It's a two-horse race in Rochdale between me and Nigel Farage. Now, you may well ask, um, it's easy to win a by-election or easier to win a by-election. How do you hold a, seat, a, a general election? And it's undoubtedly uh, more difficult. But the other parties have made it easy for me. We had a grooming scandal in Rochdale, which began by a very fat man who was the Liberal Mayor of Rochdale and later became the Liberal Member of Parliament for Rochdale and was given a knighthood even though he was routinely sexually abusing children. Children in homes, children that had no parents, children that had been taken into care, as it was laughingly described. Well, the care involved the sexual abuse, sodomy and the lash at the hands of the Liberal Democrat mayor and later member of parliament. And that grooming scandal continued and many communities got involved in it. But the one constant in the whole thing was that Labour covered up the grooming scandal in Rochdale and everybody in the town knows it. They covered it up for their own narrow sectional party interests. Quite apart from all their other failures, just up the road from me are seven beautiful blocks of flats known as the Seven Sisters, largely empty because Labour gave the property to the worst housing association in England, Rochdale Borough-wide Housing, which has allowed them to tumble and crumble into disrepair and has no idea whatsoever what to do with them. All the while, homeless people in Rochdale are being housed, only for a few days, I, I, I must say, but are being housed in the Hilton Hotel at taxpayers' expense, when there are hundreds of vacant flats 500 yards away in the Seven Sisters Tower blocks, which are not being allowed to be inhabited while they decide whether or not to knock them down. They are beautiful, iconic buildings. I commend them to you. They are architecturally a great work of art. I'm working, fighting hard to save them. It's one of my great election pledges. And of course, in 54 parliamentary sitting days, 
I delivered more for Rochdale than the last four MPs over the last 15 years. The last baby born in Rochdale was 2011. The next will be born next year in 2025. Thanks to a concession wrung by me from the health minister of the outgoing Tory government. And she made the point that we could have had it earlier. It was blocked in Labour's Manchester, not in Tory Whitehall. But that being as it may, the Labour Party cannot possibly agree to give me the credit for getting the maternity ward back. So they say, no, we're not going to have a maternity. It's going to be a birthing centre. They don't like maternity labour because they can't decide what a woman is. They can't acknowledge that only women can give birth. So they don't like to call it maternity. There'll be no breastfeeding in a labour birthing centre. It'll be chest feeding. And it'll be people who give birth and not women who are giving birth. Well, the reason they say we can't have a full maternity ward is because we don't have an A and E, an accident and emergency. Imagine a town with no maternity and no A and E. So I've got a simple solution to that. We are going to get an A and E to go along with our brand new maternity unit. I spoke to a woman today. Her brother died of a heart attack outside the empty A and E ward in Rochdale Infirmary. Just imagine that. Imagine the pain of his and his family's demise when they were outside an a and &E that Labour closed. So it's actually easier than you think in this general election campaign for me to win. Let me move to bigger international issues. The Americans have been exceedingly busy today. First of all, they programmed an attackers missile, fired no doubt by Ukrainian service personnel. Or, 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 I say no doubt, there may be a doubt, but let's give them the benefit of that doubt and say that a Ukrainian finger was on the trigger, but the missile's trajectory can only be programmed by United States experts who gave them the weapons. This Attackums missile landed and was intended to land amidst beach gores in Crimea, in Sebastopol, very famous place in the Crimean War. There's a new Crimean War now about to break out because the Russians will not allow this terrorist attack, which killed several children and maimed and mutilated many more on that beach. There you can see behind me the actual video of the missile's arrival, an American missile's arrival on a beach in Crimea. Uh, even more dastardly in terms of quantum was the terrorist attack mounted in Dagestan today. Still going on, actually. A group of bearded so-called ISIS fighters were running amok in Dagestan. They killed at least six policemen. They wounded many more policemen and now they are randomly shooting in the streets and killing civilians. Uh, two of them have been killed. Three of them have been uh, apprehended, but others are still at large. Now, some of you don't like to hear what you think is a conspiracy theory, but I'm going to tell you that ISIS and Al-Qaeda only ever attack people that the United States and its allies are already attacking, have already made official enemies of the Western Empire. See if I'm wrong. See if I am wrong. For eight months, eight months, 150,000 Palestinian refugees in a concentration camp in Gaza have been mercilessly murdered and maimed. And not an Israeli window has been broken by ISIS or Al-Qaeda. What do you think that is? Who do you think ISIS and Al-Qaeda are really working for? Who brought ISIS and Al-Qaeda into being in the first place? I think if you're a regular viewer, 
over the last five years, regular listener over the last 19 years, you already know my view on that. But the fact that Russia, again, is the subject of the terrorist attacks of ISIS, in this case still ongoing, and indeed other twin attacks taking place in other provinces of Russia nearby, details of which are still coming in, there's a full-scale attack on Russia by the Western allied ISIS organization. That's right. These terrorists in Dagestan today didn't just murder Russian policemen. They set on the local synagogue and they slit the throat of the local uh, Russian Orthodox priest. It is stunningly obvious to me, and I would have hoped to you, that these people are working for the Western Empire. Sorry for the loss of picture there. Only time for one. It is Nigel Farage that I mentioned earlier was subject to a full scale, full spectrum, political attack from all of the other parties, except mine, from all of the media, except this, for stating the bleeding obvious that the war in Ukraine was created by Western provocation, that the West provoked what happened in Ukraine as far back as 2014 when they overthrew in a violent coup the elected government that was governing there. They made no bones or any secret of the fact that they were intent upon and they achieved the overthrow of the elected government whose first act was to outlaw the Russian language spoken by fully 33 percent, one third of the entire population of Ukraine, including its president, Volodymyr Zelensky, now chief martial law administrator in the election-free zone in Kiev. The fact that this coordinated attack on Farage, on an issue that every other serious person in the world, including the Norwegian tailor, Stoltenberg, erstwhile leader of NATO, who openly stated that Russia moved to stop Ukraine joining NATO, which is exactly what Farage said. The fact that any serious commentator knows that what Farage said is true, and yet he was subjected to this withering crossfire from everywhere, every part of the orchestra of the prevailing orthodoxy shows not their strength, but their weakness. You see, Western narratives on Ukraine and on many other things are Potemkin villages. They are paper thin. All they require is someone with an audience to say the emperor has no clothes and everyone starts to look at the naked man. It's all coming up in the next one hour and 40 minutes. Stay tuned to the mother of all talk shows.